and pressing downward until you reset the tensioner. Once the tensioner is reset, you can install it into the right cylinder head. Next, align the right camshaft sprocket with the camshaft hub. Use a 3 8 breaker bar to rotate the camshaft until the holes in the hub align with those in the sprocket. And install the bolts. Install the left camshaft sprocket in the same way. Keep in mind that the holes in both sprockets will only line up one way with the holes in the hubs. Once the sprockets have been installed, you may need to rotate the engine slightly to take up slack in the timing chain. It's important not to skip over the next step in chain installation, arming the chain tensioner. Failure to arm the tensioner will cause serious problems once the engine is started. To arm the tensioner, use a flat bladed screwdriver to pry the tensioner arm towards the tensioner. This releases the ratchet mechanism and provides tension until the engine develops oil pressure. After arming the tensioner, rotate the engine one revolution clockwise so that the tensioner can extend fully. When reassembling the rest of the front, don't forget to install the camshaft position sensor. Also, keep in mind that the plated links and timing marks are not designed to line up on every rotation of the engine. So you should not rotate the engine two revolutions and expect the marks to align. Also, after you install the chain, it's normal for the engine to make some noise for five to ten seconds at startup. Before we move on to other features of the 2.7 liter engine, let's check your knowledge of chain installation with a review question. The two plated links on the primary chain are positioned near the timing mark on the A, crankshaft sprocket, B, left camshaft sprocket, C, right camshaft sprocket, or D, water pump sprocket? The correct answer is B. The mark on the left camshaft sprocket is positioned between the two plated links. Like the lower and front end, the upper end of the 2.7 liter engine has a number of special design and service features. When servicing rocker arms, keep in mind that they are unique to the 2.7 liter engine and can be identified by the presence of the oil squirt hole. You can remove the rocker arms from the cylinder head without removing the camshafts using special tools 8215 and 8216. You can remove the lash adjuster and replace it separately if it is damaged. If you plan to reinstall the lash adjuster, be sure to store it in an upright position so that the adjuster doesn't become filled with air. It is possible to install the rocker arms backwards, so during installation, take care to orient the rocker arm correctly. If you watched October's program, you know that the 2.7's camshafts are different from cams machined from a solid piece of stock. The cams are made of tubular steel with machined bearing journals, but with pressed on lobes, secondary timing sprockets, and thrust flanges. The four cams on the 2.7 liter engine are not interchangeable. Each cam has five bearing caps, which are marked to identify their location. The exhaust and intake cams, secondary chain, and secondary tensioner are removed as a unit. Be sure to see the service manual for proper removal and installation procedures. The camshafts must be removed to access the cylinder head bolts. And don't overlook the three bolts in the timing chain cavity. They must also be removed before removing the head. The cylinder head gaskets on the 2.7 liter engine are multi-layer steel construction. They include an oil restrictor hole which controls oil flow to the head. In October's Master Tech, we told you about the 2.7 liter engine's upper and lower intake manifolds, which are made of a composite material. The gaskets for the upper and lower intake are reusable but be sure to inspect any used gasket for deformation or damage before reusing it. Next, we're going to move on to the features of the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, right after this review question. True or false, the camshafts in the 2.7 liter engine must be removed to remove the cylinder head. The answer is true. 
you do need to remove the camshaft to access the head bolts. And don't forget the three head bolts in the timing chain cavity. Earlier in the program, we discussed some of the special features on the lower end of the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, such as the four spots where you need to use sealant, and the fact that the number two main bearing is the thrust bearing. Now let's look at some of the other features on the lower end of these engines. As on the 2.7 liter engine, you need to use special tool 8225 to align the rear main oil seal retainer. However, on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, the tool is flipped because the retainer contains part of the oil pan gasket. As a result, the retainer must be oriented differently than on the 2.7 liter engine. The piston and connecting rod assemblies on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines are a different design than the assemblies used on the 2.7 liter engine. The connecting rods use machined caps and the cap bolts are installed from the top. Even though the piston pin is retained by locking rings, the piston and connecting rod are replaced as an assembly. You'll notice slight recesses cut into the tops of pistons on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines. These recesses do not provide valve to piston clearance in case a timing belt breaks. They are only there to provide clearance in case the timing belt is off by no more than two teeth. Like the 2.7 liter engine pistons, the pistons in the 3.2 and 3.5 have an arrow that points towards the front of the engine. And as on the 2.7 pistons, the squirt holes must be facing the major thrust side of the block. You can use the left hand rule described earlier when we covered the 2.7 liter engine to determine the major thrust side. We need to discuss one more feature of the lower end of the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, the engine oil cooler. On both engines, an outlet line from the block and an inlet line back to the pan route oil through an engine oil cooler in the radiator tank. The oil cooler is not used with a 2.7 liter engine. Earlier in the program, we mentioned that you can use special tool 8191 to hold the crankshaft damper on the 2.7 liter engine. You can use the same tool to remove the damper on 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines. The valve timing and water pump drive system on the aluminum block 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines is similar to that used on the previous cast iron block 3.5 liter engine. The system uses a single belt to drive the water pump and the single overhead camshafts. As we said before, Unlike the previous 3.5 liter engine, the new engines are not freewheeling, and if the crank to cam timing is off by more than two teeth, damage will occur. The timing procedure is similar to that used on the previous 3.5 liter engine. One thing to keep in mind when servicing the timing belt, however, is that it is not the same length as the one used on the previous 3.5 liter engine. Another thing to keep in mind is that if you do remove the belt tensioner, be sure to store the tensioner in an upright position so that air does not enter it. The water pump on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines was introduced in 1997 as a running change on the previous 3.5 liter engine. The pump uses a six bolt mounting instead of the previous three bolts and features improved sealing. Now let's move on to some of the features on the upper end of the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines. The single overhead camshafts on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines have three cam lobes per cylinder. Two lobes are for intake valves. The third lobe actuates both exhaust valves by means of a Y-shaped rocker arm. Although the camshafts on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines look the same, they're not. You can identify 3.2 liter camshafts by the groove machined into the cam near the nose. Unlike those on 2.7 liter engines, lash adjusters on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines must be serviced with the rocker arm. However, as with the 2.7 rocker arms, if you plan to reinstall the rockers on the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, be sure to keep them upright so that air does not enter them. 
As you saw in the October Master Tech program, the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines use a composite upper intake and aluminum lower intake manifold. The PCM operates the manifold tuning valve at the front of the upper intake and the short runner valves in the center of the upper intake to maximize performance. Next, we're going to look at a procedure you need to be familiar with when refilling the cooling system. But first, try this review question. You can identify 3.2 liter engine cam shafts from those used on the 3.5 liter engine by A, the length of the cams, B, the number of bearing journals, C, a stamping on the 3.5 cam, or D, a groove near the nose of the 3.2 cam. The answer is D. The 3.2 liter engine's cam has an identifying groove near the nose. When filling the cooling systems on the Concorde, Intrepid, LHS, or 300M, to avoid trapping air in the cooling system, be sure to use the procedure and special tools specified in the service manual. First, make sure the radiator drain is closed. Then attach one end of a quarter inch hose to the bleed valve on the engine. On the 3.2 and 3.5 liter engines, the bleed valve is located on the lower intake manifold. On the 2.7 liter engine, the bleed valve is located on the water outlet connector on the front of the engine. Route the hose away from the components on the front of the engine and place the other end in a coolant container. Next, open up the bleed valve on the engine. At this point, attach the filling aid funnel, special tool 8195, to the pressure recovery bottle filler neck. Use the clip attached to the funnel to pinch off the hose between the two chambers of the coolant bottle. Now pour a 50-50 mixture of distilled water and Mopar 5-year, 100,000-mile antifreeze coolant into the large side of the funnel. The smaller side allows air to escape. It's important to use only five-year, 100,000-mile coolant in the system. Mopar's five-year coolant can be identified by its orange color. The use of other coolant types will not provide the additives that permit extended change intervals. Continue filling the cooling system until a steady stream of coolant flows from the bleed valve hose. Then close the bleed valve and continue filling the system to the top of the funnel. Remove the clip from the overflow hose and allow the coolant in the funnel to flow into the overflow chamber. Remove the filling aid funnel. Install the cap on the pressure recovery bottle and remove the hose from the bleed valve. Keep in mind that it's normal for the coolant level in the pressure chamber to drop as any air in the engine is pushed into the bottle. Also keep in mind that once any air is out of the system and the cooling system has had the chance to replace it with coolant, the coolant will not flow into the recovery chamber unless the engine overheats. Well, that about does it for our look at the 2.7, 3.2, and 3.5 liter engines. As we said at the beginning of the program, the engines are not really difficult to work on if you use the correct procedures and the right tools. Now stay tuned for information about the results of the Master Tech Survey.